Welcome to worship. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, looking forward to some beautiful worship and then to some awesome turkey bowling <laughs> afterwards. Uh, starting out with our call to worship, Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. Amen. Please stand if you care to and join us in song. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. I will worship. I will worship with all of my heart. With all
Good morning and welcome to Surfside Church. I'd like to invite the boys and girls to come on up for the children's message. Come on down. You're the next contestant on Children's Message or Us. All right, today it's a quiz about shapes. What's this? Oh, okay. What's this? A pumpkin. A pumpkin. Wow, you guys are doing great. What's this? And if we turn it like this, what is it? Oh, I got half of you, didn't I? All right, good job. Yeah, all these things that we have here, are, what does it say? Who's my readers here? I'm, I, I am thankful for. I am thankful for, yes. These are all different things that are over there on the table where people have been writing what they're thankful for, and we'll be able to put that up and to say what we're thankful for. Now, did you know that whenever you pray, right, you guys know praying is talking to God, right? Yep. Yep. Now, did you know that whenever you talk to God, it's also a good thing? to say thank you, right? You can thank God for things. Oftentimes when we come and pray, we say, God, please help me with my test. God, please help me not kill my sister. God, please help me be able to make it through this and that and the other thing. Please let my parents let me watch my TV show that I want to see, all those kinds of things. We keep asking and asking. Are you making your way, babe? That's good. You're cool. But it's also good to say thank you to God. God, thank you for making me feel better. God, thank you that whatever it is. So I'm going to ask you a question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? She's ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes, you are ready. What are you, Shay, what are you thankful for? Mommy and Daddy. Mommy and Daddy? What are you thankful for? Angels. Angels. What are you thankful for? Trains. Trains. What are you thankful for? I'm thankful for my mommy. You're thankful for your mommy. Very good. What are you thankful for? Nothing. Well, you missed the whole first half of the lesson. It's okay to be thankful for things and say thank you to God for things. What are you thankful for? Very good. Very good. Very good. What are you thankful for, Eloise? I'm thankful for buying things from the store. You're thankful for buying things from the store? That's right. I'm thankful for honesty. Very good. All right. What are you thankful for, little one? Nothing. Nothing. You guys are working on it. Your sisters for sure. All right, what are you thankful for? Your church family. And your family. All right. And Celeste. And Celeste. Yeah, and Celeste. Hi, what are you thankful for? Her thumb. Her thumb. That's a good thing to be thankful for all the way. All right. Yeah, so I hope that, because we're coming up to what holiday is it on Thursday? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. That's right. So take time to, to remember what you're thankful for. And whenever you're praying to God and talking to God, right? Just remember that even as you make, ask him for the things that you want, you also take time to say thank you to him for all the things that he's given you and even thanking him just for his love and for who he is. All right? Very good. Thank you for all your answers and thank you for helping. And let's take a moment to say thank you to God. Let's bow our heads. God, thank you for our lives. Thank you for these children. Thank you for your blessings over us and over them. Thank you for the fact that your angels watch over them. And thank you that you are with us each and every day of our lives, in the high times and in the low times. We thank you for who you are and for all that you've given us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, boys and girls. And you guys can head off to Kiddo Church. She's like, I just got here. Now they're all leaving. Where are they going? I love the uh, shape things you were doing there. I've, I've never heard those things called shapes. Shapes? But, yeah, oh. I, I, that was cool. So our, our keyboard player is also a retired educator, so I'm getting high marks over there for that. Yeah, high marks. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, my gosh. That was punny. 
<laughs> a couple of announcements just to touch on here. You'll see most of them in your bulletin there. But we do have the thankful shapes that you can fill out over there uh, and leave your mark on them by writing out whatever you'd like to say, and then you know, we'll hang them up. Um, we have the lunch after church today. You're welcome and invited to that. If you're tuning in online and you're somewhere here in town, you have oh, about... I can preach extra long if you want, but you, have, you start heading this way. You can get here and have some lunch with us. It's free, and you're invited to come. Um, we will also have a lunch again next week. Uh, next week's our question and answer Sunday. We'll have our regular potluck afterwards, and then we'll work on decorating the church for Advent and Christmas. Uh, and you can see the other things that we have there in the bulletin and as far as announcements. So let's take a moment now and worship by our giving. sky, traced out by the city lights, my world is a mile high, best seat in the house tonight, touch down on the cold black top, hold on for the sudden stop, breathe in a familiar shock of confusion and chaos, are those people go? Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the brokenhearted. Ones of the far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the once forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. God, we come before you, 
offering ourselves and our hearts in prayer. Lord, we come with offerings of thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you that you are holy. We thank you that you are all-powerful and that you're all-present. Lord, we thank you for the creation that you paint around us each day. God, we thank you for your spirit with us to grant us peace, to grant us strength, to give us hope, or to give us, it, it, to, to supply us with what we need as we journey one moment at a time with you through this life. God, we thank you that your spirit is here with us now, and as your spirit moves among us, we open our hearts to you. We open our minds to you. We open our eyes to you. That you would anoint them. That we would see as you see. That we would think as you think. That we would love as you love, and we would serve as you serve. Holy Spirit, anoint our ears that we would hear you and be able to discern your voice. And it's with thankful hearts that as we come together here, we lift up to you the requests that are in our hearts and in our souls. Lord, there are those that are in our families that need your healing. Lord, they need, they need healing in body. They need healing in mind. They need healing in their emotions. They need healing in their soul. So, Lord, we lift them up as an offering to you. And we know, Lord, just speak the word and they'll be healed. And we ask you through the authority of our Savior Jesus that that word be spoken and that healing come. Father, as we get, it will be gathering soon. Many of us will be gathering with family, some of us friends. Some of us will just be getting together together with just the, an intimate circle of people around this Thanksgiving. Holy Spirit, open opportunities for us to share the goodness of God, your goodness with those that are gathered around the table, to do it with gentleness and respect. But as you give us the words, help us to share, help us to be bold enough and loving enough to, to bring those words together with the actions that we have. Lord, for those that we know that we want to have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ, to be reconciled with you through Jesus Christ, we know that they need this in their life. Lord, we ask that you would open those doors, that you would anoint their ears, that you would anoint their heart, their soul, their eyes to be able to respond to you and the nudges and to hear the words of hope and salvation and reconciliation. Lord, we ask that you would bind the enemy, that you would bind the enemy from, from stealing the truth from those who we love, that we're reaching out with the message of Christ. So that as that truth lands upon their heart, it would take root and begin to grow. And grant them a hunger for that truth as it guide them to your scriptures to begin to search. Father, we thank you for that good work that you do, drawing all people to yourself. We thank you that it's your desire that all be saved and reconciled with you. So we thank you and ask that you continue that good work. And we thank you, Lord, now that you are here with us. We thank you for the miracles that you have done among our family members and the healing. We thank you for the salvation that's coming among. We thank you for how you're, you're, you're moving and you're working. We thank you for what is yet to come. But we are gathered together here in this day and in this moment to hear from you. And so we ask, Lord, that you would open our understanding as we look into the words that Jesus was taught to his disciples. We thank you that you are offering yourself to us now. And we rest in that offering. We receive that offering. And it's with profound gratitude that we just rest in that. It's through your son, Jesus, that we pray. Through your son, Jesus, that we worship. Through your son, Jesus, that we live. Amen. And amen.
<laughs> so Jesus continues on telling stories as he's talking to his disciples. We're picking up where we left off last week because Jesus wasn't done teaching them. We took a, a segment of it, but Jesus continues on in this in Matthew 25 in verse 14. He continues on with the teaching and talking to them about what's going on. And he uses this imagery now of a man who basically entrusts his estate, entrusts his wealth, entrusts the things that he has to his servants, to his slaves, his servants, whichever word you want to use. He's giving them talents. Now, Talent, just to kind of go into this story here, talent is more of a measure of weight for money than what it is an actual coin. It could be a talent, it could be like a bag full of a talent of, a weight of silver, a weight of gold, but these things, it was a lot that they were receiving. All right, it was, and it's interesting that Jesus uses this word talent, and this is the one that's, that's in the scriptures for us on this. He, to allow for maybe a broader understanding of the story as we look at it. Because he could have said a coin, he could have said a denarius, he could have said a bunch of things in order to put the same connotation in here. But instead, he uses talent. So I'm going to go to the story here in Matthew 25 and share it with all of you. And I'm using a very small print Bible because I'm using the Revised Standard Version of it because it uses the word talent without trying to convert it into something else. Um, in here, the New Revised Standard. So, Matthew 25, starting at verse 14. I can read it off the screen, too. It is Jesus to say this to his disciples, his followers, the twelve that are with him. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, so five weight measures of money. To another two, to the other two, uh, okay, five talents. To another person, he gave two. To another, he gave one. To each, according to his ability. And then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them. It also says, in the, in, kind of in the Greek nuance here, worked with them, put them to work. All right? And made five talents more, five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made five more. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into, into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I've made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The one who'd received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed, so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Now here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested, have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." Well, here we go, one story after another, but with an ending that's kind of like, what in the world is going on with all this? And it's being spoken to the disciples. It's being spoken to the 12. It's being spoken now to those of us who follow along later. So what is happening here? Well, first thing we want to see in this as we kind of walk through it is that each person is given, a, each person is giving this talent, this weight, of this bag of, of fortune, if you will, to go use. It's being given to them according to their ability. All right, so then no one has an expectation higher than what their ability is among the three. So it's not like the one who receives two is expected to make five. 
All right, the one who has the higher ability is given five to go out and use and see what happens. The one who has, uh, is, has the, the abilities a little bit at a lower level on this is given the two. And then the one who has not them as many resources about for him is given one. And he's only held accountable for their ability. They're not expected to do more than what they were entrusted with. The other thing about this story is that it's more than money. This story is about more than just, okay, if, I, if God gives me money or whatever, if we take this parable, then I go out and use it the right way, then I'm going to double my money and that kind of thing. And if I bury it in the ground, I'm not going to do it. This is, not the, this is back where the word play comes into, into this, where it's talent. It leaves us open to knowing it's more than just money and what Jesus is teaching here about this. And probably it's not, it's not about money at all in, in a lot of this, but it's, it's about gifts. It's about abilities. Even whenever the, included in this story is the phrase, according to their ability. According to their ability, it brings this into play. So we're actually talking more about um, gifts, abilities, how they're, how they're wired. And as they receive according to this, they take what the master's given them and they apply it. They invest it. They work with it within the means of what they have in the way that they're naturally wired, the resources that are around them, and also in the gifts that they have. So as we look at this, then, and what's going on in this story is the one, two of, two of the folks get the work. The one who receives the five gets the work. He starts working on it. He's investing. He's putting it to work. He's, he's doing things with it. He's taking risks. Two, the one who received the two is doing the same thing. I'm going to put this to work. I'm going to get it going and, and see what happens with it and take the risk to have it happen. The, one of these guys, though, is afraid. He says it. He even confesses it. It's actually the first thing out of his mouth when he goes to talk to the master. When the master comes back to, for accounts, he says, I know. He starts, he starts lining that up for us. It's not just, here's your talent or I'm giving it back to you. It's, I know you're this, I know you're that, and I was afraid. And so one of them's afraid. The other thing that we have happening in this story is like last week's story. The master has gone for a long time. The last week it was the bridegroom was delayed in coming. This one in this story is Jesus is teaching. The, the person here, the main center of all this is delayed. He's gone. He's, he's, he's gone off. And he's coming back. But while he's gone off and gone away for a long time, he does return and he does settle accounts with each of the three. Two of them receive approval and blessing and inclusion. One receives rebuke and ultimately rejection. So why does Jesus teach this to his followers, the original 12, and to us? Well, one is there's work to be done. He's teaching his disciples that even though the first parable be ready. It's, it might be delayed and longer. Make sure that you're prepared and all this. But it, there's also, in this story now, let's build upon that. And while you're waiting and, and being prepared for the bridegroom to return at an hour, you don't know when he's going to come back, be at work. The master is giving you, has, is giving you and has given you gifts to use and be at work while you're waiting. Be at work. And you're going to be held accountable for the work that you are entrusted to do. You're entrusted to get the job done. You're entrusted, as he's teaching this to the 12 and to us, you're entrusted with God's possessions. In this story, it wasn't that the master came to the slaves and the servants and said, I want you to work out of your own resources. I want you to work out of your own stuff and see what you can do. I want you to dig out your own denarius. I want you to dig out your own money and start working and see how much you can make for the master. And then whenever I come back, bring that to me. No, he gives the seed capital. He gives to them what they need. So he's giving the gifts. So God is giving the gifts and is distributing it among them. So in this story, the 12 disciples are receiving gifts and will receive gifts from the master. If we look to the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes down upon all of them, some of them are given tongues, some are given the interpretation of tongues. Among all these other gifts that we see in Romans 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12, when you take a look at those, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit gives these, and when we look at those verses, gives to each person according to their ability. The Holy Spirit determines who receives what for the building up of the church and according to their abilities. And so the 12 receive this, and so do we out of this story. We receive the gifts that God gives us, and we are to use the gifts that are God's entrusted to us to be able to use it and apply it and get it to work, put them to work to see what happens. And, when we, and we are to invest for God's work what God has given us and see what the return will be. 
Now, the other thing that happens in this story is that inv investment involves risk. Investment involves risk. Many, we, we, most of us naturally grow up risk averse. We don't want risk. Some of us are too far to the risk side. We're like thrill seekers and we love risk. Some of us say, if, if, there, if even there's a small R anywhere near the word near me, I'm out, I'm going somewhere else. But investment involves risk. Investing your life and your talents, the gifts and abilities for God, does involve risk. But risk has reward. And God rewards, the, rewards those who take the risks. Now the re reward in this, as Jesus is teaching this story, the reward isn't money. Whenever, when we get to the story here and all this, that pretty much when we look at it, the story isn't, is kind of like, okay, here's five more, and they're returning it back to the master. Only in one spot in this story do we see where the one who buried the one, it's like, take that and give it to the one who had 10 already. Otherwise, they're returning everything. But their reward is, you've been faithful and little, but you're in charge of much. And their reward is, well done, good and faithful servant. So hearing the words of God's approval saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's joy. And so the reward is stepping into the joy that God gives. The, the, the paradise that he's created, stepping into those things. Those are the rewards that we're looking at in this. The reward isn't money. It's, getting a 100, it's not getting a 100% return on the silver or the gold. The reward is hearing God speak, well done. And the reward is entering God's joy. Now, fear involves... We looked at the guy who was afraid. The fear involves preserving and hiding from risk. And so the, the one fellow here at the end who received the one talent, and he received one because uh, somewhere in there it looks like the master perceived that this, this fellow here wasn't at a higher ability level with the five or the two. It's like, here, I'm giving you one. I'm entrusting you with one. And that's all that like, you're being held accountable for. But in this, for this person, we might ask, why so harsh for the one who buried the talent? Why weeping and gnashing of teeth? Why all this? And I ask the same questions. But when I look at some of this too, for someone who buries their, the God-given spark that they have, the God-given talent, the God-given call, the thing that's nudging and pushing, if, if it stays buried, it oftentimes results in a person feeling loss from a wasted life, from missed opportunities. And they sit there at the end of their life going, if only I had. If only I'd done this, if only I had done this. And there's weeping and there's gnashing of teeth. Now, Jesus is going harder with this too in this parable about it's actually being cast out. You're not entering into the master's joy. But when I look at this too, it's also back to a reality check of that Oh, man, what did I do with my life? Could that be the one talent that the one person was entrusted with, the life that God gives you as a gift? Now go invest it for this one person. But each was given according to their abilities. And this one, this, the one who received the one, needed only put it in the bank according to this story, needed only put it in the bank and gain interest by letting it sit there rather than being buried in the ground. It might have been easier to deposit that one talent in the bank than what it was to dig the hole in order to put the bag of money in the hole and cover it up. But as the story is in this, it's like if you just take the one, for the one who's entrusted with little, if you just take the one and apply it and live it out and let people see it and let the people see the gift of God in you, it'll bear interest. And you too will enter into the joy of your master. So with this hard parable, and these are all, as these stories come together here, one behind the other, uh, we're, we're coming into, as Jesus is going to make the main point at the end of these stories, is actually starts talking about the last day when people are separated and some are put on his right, some are put on his left. It's talking about the last judgment day and all these other things. And these things are being taught right before Jesus is going to the cross. These are like the last teaches he has for his disciples in Matthew before he heads to the cross. 
Now, fortunately, we, don't, we know that this is not the end of the story. The cross is not the end of the story for Jesus. He comes out of the tomb on the third day, he continues to talk with his disciples. He continues to be with them. They, they were there concerned about things and doubtful about things and worried about being abandoned by him. He's there with them, and they see him actually eat. They, they are with him over a period of 40 days before he ascends into heaven, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon them and equips them and gives these gifts, these talents to them to go out and use. And the good news for us is when we received Christ as our Savior, we also received the Holy Spirit. We asked to receive the Holy Spirit. We're baptized by water and in our baptism stuff, we say in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, so that we also receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you gifts to use. But as we go to wrap this up, even Jesus, even Jesus as he invested his life, as he invested his gifts and abilities and talents, he looked forward to his reward. He looked forward to the joy set before him. Even as he taught his disciples over here, he said, you know, enter into your master's joy. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 gives us this where he, he endured the cross, scorning its shame for the joy set before him. He endured all this. So as he invested his gifts, as he invested his talents, as he invested his life at high risk, for all this, to the point of even being nailed to the cross, he was looking beyond that to his master's joy, to the heavenly father's joy that was, was carrying him through and that he was going to enter into on this other side. And Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, if you ever want to take, uh, get it kind of into context here, you've got to look at Hebrews 11. Some of you may know Hebrews 11. It's, it's oftentimes named the faith chapter. It's this litany of all these different names of people and how they invested their talents, really. Their abilities, their life. And for some of them, there was great reward in this life. But for all of them, the great reward came in the next life. But after this whole line of people is presented by the writer of Hebrews through chapter 11, when we get to 12, he actually brings, the writer brings it around to Christ, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. He enters into his master's joy even as everybody in 11 enters into the master's joy, even as the people in this story in Matthew enter into, master, into their master's joy, even as we do, as we in, invest our lives, even if it's just putting our life in God's hands, in the bank, to be put wherever we're put and to share the story of what he's doing and live out our faith and see what interest comes from it. So God has given you talents. God's given me talents. They're different from each other. We're different from each other. Some of you are great at accounting. I am not. Some of you are great at coding and troubleshooting networks and other things computer. I press the on button, and if it doesn't work, I press the on button again. I'm not great at that, that kind of stuff. I know enough to be dangerous. I break things so I can take them to IT people and get them fixed. But those kinds of things. But we're all gifted different ways. We, musicians are gifted with the gift of music and within their instruments, the cer certain ones that, that they gravitate to and become a, a, an expression of their soul. We all have different gifts. We all have different talents. But together, we invest them for God. And when we do this, we're only held accountable for what God has given us. We're only held accountable for what he's given to us. So we don't have to get into comparison with somebody else saying, well, I really need to, have, I really need to be at a five-talent level here. Otherwise, God doesn't approve of me. God approves you. He made you. He created you. You have the gifts, the talents, the aptitudes, the things that you have on purpose from him. And you, can, you, you work within that influence that you have wherever he's placed you. And you're only held accountable for that. You're not held accountable for somebody else. You're only held accountable for you. So continue, continue to work with the talents God has entrusted to you. Though it might be a long time in coming on the reward, though, it, though the master may be a long time in coming and coming back to say, all right, show me what you've done. Though the master may be a long time in coming back to say, it's time to enter into your master's joy. Continue to work with the talents that God has entrusted to you. And it... It might be hard work. It might just, it may, it may be in positions and places where it, it, this is an effort to do it. 
It's an effort to continue to use this talent. But it's the talent that God has given to you. It's a talent that he's calling you to use in a particular environment. And it, it, it might take everything that you have. There's no guarantee that it's easy. If you look through Hebrews 11, you'll see that. There was a pastor. I don't know if you saw the story, but he was in, in Arizona. It came out in the news yesterday. In his 20s, late 20s, father, husband, he was out on a street corner in Arizona at a major intersection in this town where everything's going back and forth, and he was out street preaching, and he was out presenting the gospel out on the street. He was shot in the head. He was using his talents. He was investing his life. He was taking the risk. And we say, well, why didn't the gun jam? Why didn't the bullet miss? Why did the bullet hit him? And say, we have all those questions that we don't know. But he's in the hospital now, as of the story yesterday, in serious condition, as you can imagine, if you get shot in the head. And they're looking for the suspect who did it. Since it was a busy intersection, I'm assuming it was coming out of a car as a car was going by. But here is, we don't have to look to Hebrews 11 for examples of people who risk it, who invest it, who are out there doing it in order to transform lives and to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in my joy into my joy. It may be hard work, it will be hard work, but you will receive the reward. You will hear the Lord saying, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my joy. So continue to invest those talents. It's not a sin to be afraid. I guess I need to make sure we know this. Risk, I mean, we, it's okay to be afraid of risk. It's what do you do with it? Take your fears and give them to the master. Take your fears and give them to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm, I'm investing, I'm using these talents that you've given me, but I have to confess to you that it's terrifying me. It's, it's wearing me out. There's no sin in that. It's okay. And one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the courage and the perseverance to continue the act of investing what the Lord has given to you for his work so that others would come into the kingdom of God and know. So it's okay. What's not okay <laughs> is digging a hole in the ground and hiding. I think that's probably why Jesus taught that because they were about to be tested in a major way, right? They were about to be tested whenever Jesus was arrested and put before trial. All of the, his followers fled. Didn't mean that they were digging holes in the ground, just meant that they were confused. And then when the Holy Spirit poured out upon them, they were emboldened in the way that people said, what in the world is going on? And they were able to share. They were able to handle persecution. They were able to handle being scattered about and on the move. And everywhere they went, they didn't hide their faith. Everywhere they went, they spoke Jesus and spoke about the goodness of God with thankful hearts. And people were changed everywhere they went. Even Peter who considered Barry digging a hole. I don't know him. Was that one scoop? I don't know the man, scoop two. Who are you doing, scoop three? The rooster goes and calls him to account and says, oh, wait. And he goes and weeps bitterly. But what happened? What's the rest of the story? Wasn't Jesus saying, yeah, buddy, told you that was going to happen. Are you going to come grovel or something? Uh-uh. Jesus, he's such a good guy. He makes breakfast for Peter. Yeah, look at the back end of John. I mean, the hole was, the, the, I think Peter was almost about ready to fill the hole with water and say, you know, let's, I'm going to go back to fishing. And so they go out and go, they go, he's like, I'm done. I'm confused. I've denied him three times. I'm um, damaged goods. He called it. I did it. And I'm supposed to be the rock, and I just want to bury 
my rock somewhere. And so they're out fishing after the resurrection and everything has happened, but, and Jesus had appeared to other people, but not here yet apparently, and that's how the story goes. But they're out there, and he, he's appeared. Peter's seen him. All this stuff is going, has been going on, but now Peter's like, still, there's that tension, I think. So he's out fishing. He says, I'm going fishing. The other guy, some guys say, we're going with you. So they go out and fish, and they fish all night. And then as they're coming back to the beach, they see a fire. They see coals on a fire. They see this. And they hear someone standing, someone standing by the fire in that dim twilight before the sun gets high enough over the horizon to really make anything out. And a voice calls out across the water, hey, did you catch anything? Now, if you've applied your talents all through the night and caught nothing, Trust me, I'm a fisherman. And someone says, did you catch anything? The last thing you want to say is, no, I didn't catch a thing. But that's what they say. So the voice from the beach says, throw your nets over on that side. Peter, I think somewhere, where did I hear that before? He applies his talent again, and he throws his net on the other side, and it's loaded up with fish, and he's like, oh, and he scrambles and runs up to the beach. Well, they get up there, and he says, bring some of the fish you've caught. And there's already breakfast cooking there. And they sit there, and they eat breakfast together. And then Jesus is like, Peter, come, come take a walk with me down the beach. Anybody here like beach walks? I do. It's been a long time. I need to go do one. But we'll go walking on the beach. So they go walking down the beach. And Jesus, knowing Peter, because you know, Jesus was around when Peter was created. He knows him by name formed him in his mother's womb, as the Psalms tell us. But as he's walking along with him, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, yeah, you know I do. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Or, and his heart's breaking at this point, you know I love you. He's like, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And as the, even as the sand that la, water that laps over the sand fills up the hole and brings it all smooth again and a fresh start, the denials of days before are washed away. And Peter starts again. He starts again so well, he looks over his shoulder and says, what about that guy? Because John's hiding out in the background, kind of eavesdropping so he could write it all down, right? Because it's his gospel that it's in. What about him? Jesus is like, Peter, you worry about me and you. I'll worry about him. Only held accountable for what you've been given. And the one who gives it to you loves you and is walking with you. And when you're exhausted and worn out in investing and the risk seems to get too high and the fear levels start going through the ceiling, rest in the arms of the master instead of burying it in the dirt. And you will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's joy. A hard teaching, hopeful teaching, and one that still applies to us, even as it did to the 12. Let us pray together. Holy and loving God, you are our master. You are our creator. You are the one who gives us the gifts that you entrust to us to invest, to use for your work. And as we're gathered before you here, and as we hear this message whenever, forever who tunes into it, Lord, our first, if we could make a request of you, our first one is help us overcome our fear. We confess it to you. And we welcome your strength to come and replace that. It's not our strength that does it. It's not our courage that does it. It's your strength and your courage that lifts us up. And we welcome that. And Lord, help us when we are unsure when we are overwhelmed, and when we're, we are weary.
where we began investing with joy and excitement at the risk and what was the reward going to be and the rewards did not come easy. And some of what we thought was reward turned into loss. And yet we continue to try to stay in the game. But if we're honest, we're exhausted. Lord, we ask for your help. Renew our strength. Renew our souls. Help us to know what to surrender to you, to give to you that, that we're reaching for and that we're trying to juggle and, and hold on to, that you, you're telling us, you're whispering to us, this is, is, I've got this, let me handle this. Step back into your, your calling. Step back into what I've really entrusted you with. Stop trying to grab for more. Let me handle that. You handle what I've asked you to handle and I'll be your strength. Lord, we receive that. Father, by your Spirit, show us how to best invest the talents that you have entrusted to us. Open our eyes to recognize them. And then show us how to use them, where to use them. And Lord, through this journey, we set our eyes upon your joy. Oh, our eyes can get turned to the balance sheet. Our eyes can get turned to the the wins and losses. Our eyes can get turned to the next problem. Our eyes, it it begs for our focus upon that. Even as as Jesus was on the cross and the joy for the joy set before him, and he kept that joy in front of him in order to make it through it. There are people around his feet taunting him, trying to get his focus upon them. Father, help us to keep our eyes upon your joy and what's ahead. Father, we ask for, if you would, the gift of just giving us a glimpse of that as an encouragement so that we can know thank you that you're with us. Thank you that you, that you trust us and entrust us with this task. Thank you that you're with us all through it. Thank you for the joy that lies ahead. And thank you, Lord, for those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. We look forward to the day when we can feel your breath on our face as you speak those words. We thank you for your goodness, O God. Continue to move among us now as we worship in music yet again. We yield to your spirit. Amen.
freed my soul for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of mine. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days and then you walked right out again now death has no sting and life has no end for i have been transformed by the blood
of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness of God I will see of the goodness of God We thank you Jesus we lift your name up in, in praise we, we, we thank you for your forgiveness we thank you for your mercy we thank you for your presence I thank you for all of the reasons I have in my life to, to give thanks to you and all of those times when nothing but your goodness has carried me through. I pray for each person in this room that they'll know your goodness, that they'll know your love, that, you'll, that they'll know and for, feel your forgiveness. I pray for each person in our lives that, that have yet to embrace you, that have let, yet to know you. I pray that our actions, our words, our behavior, the things that we say, the things that we do, that all of these things will point to you and that it'll be so clear to each person that so needs you so much, that you are the way, that you are the truth, that you are the life, and that no one can come to God except through Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for these things. I thank you for your mercy. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. of the goodness of God.